deserve to be treated with dignity. And it's the one, it's the one aspect of our shared humanity that we can use to see each other, not as us and them, as Shania pointed out. Because we're going to have to overcome that. I'm really glad you play, played that little clip. Because my, my colleagues in the, from the workshop know that we do, we are, we do come into the world with these instincts. And they know all about the 10 temptations of violating our own dignity. But creating an us and them is one of these powerful instincts. And those of us, who want to learn how to put dignity as a, into a way of life for ourselves, we have to know that these are certain things that we have to overcome. And creating this transcendent identity, it's the way, it's the way it works. And, you know, and I also think that this yearning for dignity that each and every one of us shares, it's our, it's our com highest common denominator. It's our highest common denominator. Our lowest common denominator is what comes out of those perceptions of us and them. It's what creates the dignities. But if we can think about ourselves as a, a shared, having a shared human identity where we all want to be treated well, I think that's one way of getting to this source of universal source of healing. So, okay, what is dignity? Well, I'm curious what you would say. And anybody here could just, just tell me what comes to mind when you think of the word dignity. Pride. Pardon? Pride. Pride, okay. Anything else? Self-esteem. Self yeah. Most of the time people say respect as the first word that comes to their mind. And I want to make a distinction of, um, whoops, sorry. Oh, gave away my, uh, my treasure. Um, I want to make a distinction between dignity and respect because I think that respect, uh, dignity is something very basic to each and every one of us. It's our inherent value and worth. It's our inherent value and worth. All of us, um, we are all born with dignity. And you know, the, if you have any trouble imagining that, here's this little, uh, one of my favorite slides is of this baby. Um, because when you look at this child, it's pretty obvious that this little one has an inherent value and worth. It'd be kind of hard to argue, no, this baby doesn't have value, we're going to get rid of it. You'd never do that in a million. And, and yet, when these babies grow up, we have a hard time getting back to this notion that we are all born valuable, right? And I often think, well, maybe we should wear, you know, like, if we have the same tags, we should have these things around our neck every single day of our lives with our baby pictures on it. So everybody will know, I'm really valuable, right? I'm, I'm worthy. And in fact, when you look at these babies, I think say more that, that this baby is valuable. I think you would say it's invaluable. You can't put a price on this child. And it's irreplaceable. So what do you do with something that's invaluable, priceless, and irreplaceable? What do you do with it? You certainly don't treat it badly, right? You treat it with the utmost care and attention. So invaluable, priceless, and irreplaceable. I and mean, just keep that in the back of your mind about yourselves and about others as well. If we can develop this consciousness, then I think we're well on the road to understanding what dignity is about. So here's something I want to, um, some research that I want to share with you. This was astonishing research, and what the, what it, Basically, uh, the study was about where there, um, these researchers in, at UCLA did brain scans, these functional magnetic resonance imaging scans on people's brains under different circumstances, right? So what they found was that when someone had a physical injury, it shows up in the brain in the same area, in this one particular area, which is a very primitive center. So you, you give somebody, you know, you break somebody who breaks an arm and you get a nice cast put on it. Well, your brain has this reaction and it hurts like crazy, right? But the other thing is that they found in this study was that when somebody felt shamed, humiliated, or treated as if they were a second-class citizen, 
it also showed up in exactly the same area of the brain as a physical wound. All right, so think, think about the importance of that for a minute. It means that, I mean, if you think how much time and effort we spend on healing physical injuries, we take people to the emergency room, we you know, put this nice fancy cast on it, we, you know, we, we get such sympathy. You know, I remember as a little kid, I always wanted to break something so that I could have a cast like that. I remember my neighbor next door, my, my little friend had a broke her arm, and she had this cast and people with, with white in those days, and people would sign it, and she would get so much attention. So we get nothing, There's, we get no attention whatsoever from the outside world when we've been humiliated, when we've been shamed, when we've been treated as if our dignity didn't matter. So this, this research was something that was a sea change for me. It was something that shifted. I felt so joyful when I read, when I saw this literature, because I knew this was the evidence that I needed to take this stuff on the road and say to people in high places, prime ministers, governments, business leaders, you've got to pay attention to this dignity stuff. You've got to pay attention to the way, the way you treat other people. Whether it's through government policy, whether it's through you know, business policy, whether it's just the way you treat each other on a daily basis, we have to figure this out and we have to pay attention to it. Now, there's one other thing that I wanted to tell you about, um, about these wounds to dignity. And I didn't even mention this to my, my group you know, in the last couple of days, but this is a very important point, that when, when somebody's dignity is wounded, you know, yes, it shows up in, as in their individual brains and it hurts terribly and, and it needs to be healed. But the other thing that it does when your dignity is wounded is that it destroys the relationship. Whoever it was that did the wounding, whether it's your boss, whether it's your uh, you know, partner, whether it's somebody from an, another community that you're having a conflict with, the minute these dignity violations start, the relationship breaks down. And it breaks down even if you have to stay together, right? And what happens to these, to these relationships where they suffer indignities is that the relationship is really fraught with resentment, right? You want to get even. Uh, and it's, it's, it's not only destructive to the individual, but destructive to the relationship. So here's another really important point. Um, that I want to emphasize about dignity. And that is that dignity is something that can be wounded, right? It can be trampled upon. We can have a, a, a really serious injury to our dignity. But the fact is, our dignity is something that is, can never be taken away from us. And how did I come to this conclusion? Well, I always thought, in the beginning, I used to think, well, you know, our dignity is Maybe somebody does have the power to take away my dignity, and I feel really bad about that, and I feel less than, and I feel humiliated by that. But the fact is, in reading this book by Nelson Mandela, you know, the uh, president of South Africa, let's pray he's safe well, he's not a poor man that's really suffering at this moment, but he, he told a story in this book about being on Robben Island you know, for all those years, you know, but when he first got into the prison, he decided he had to figure out what the guards were up to. Because he knew if he could figure out what the guards were up to, he might be able to, he and his colleagues might be able to make it, right? So guess what he figured out the first day? First day, he figures out that the guards are up to, wanting to take away their dignity. They wanted to strip them of their dignity. So he said in the next line of the book, oh, and I was so relieved. You were relieved that they're trying to strip you of your dignity. And, and then I read further and he said, no, because my dignity is in my hands only. I know that it can be wounded and that I can suffer terribly from a dignity violation, but nobody can take it away from me. And I swear, this is what he says. This is how he survived 27 years in Ramadan, being humiliated, treated as less than. You can imagine what they did that they did to him. And so the, and the other thing is about that, and when, you, when you know that your dignity is in your hands only, the powerful thing about that is that 
you, you can bounce back. After somebody mistreats you, you can bounce back. You can always get back to that notion that my dignity is in my hands and nobody can take it away from me. So you take a look at this guy. Does this guy look like somebody who spent 27 years in prison? I just love this photograph. I don't know about you. But I look at that and I think here is the sec key to resilience for all of us. Because, I, by the way, I've never met anybody who hasn't suffered some kind of dignity violation and have felt really bad about ourselves and really struggling with our sense of self-worth. So take a look. Um, he is living, you know, proof that we can all bounce back. Even under the most horrible circumstances, we can bounce back. Okay, so uh, the 10 elements of dignity. These are, when I was doing my research, uh, I, I realized that one of the things that people were asking me about throughout my time writing this book was, well, okay, this is important. You know, we know dignity is important. We feel it in our gut, right? We feel the dignity. And people were so happy when I told them that I was writing a book about dignity. But then in the same breath, they said, well, how can you possibly fill an entire book? You know, what's there to say about dignity? And I thought, there lies the problem, right? We know dignity is, is important to us, but we don't really know what it is. We don't have a real sense of the, the complexity of the issue. So I went and did thousands of interviews with people from all over the world, Asia, Africa, South America, North America, uh, certainly Europe. Uh, and, and what I discovered was that people felt similarly about how, what they thought dignity was. And so we're starting with um, identity. This one came up almost first, that when people feel their dignity is honored, their identity is accepted no matter who they are. And they feel a sense of recognition of that identity. They feel that they've, you know, whether it's recognition in the form of being included in a political process or just simple recognition between you and the people with whom you come in contact with. 